The Tolkien Road, Episode 40, The Silmarillion, Chapter 10, of the Sendar. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we resume our discussion of the Silmarillion with Chapter 10 of the Sindar, wherein we learn what's been going on with Elway, Melian, and the rest of the folks that missed the boat to the Blessed Realm. By the way, if you haven't already, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show. All right. Let's get this party started. Let's do it. I we got know. a uh, hello, everyone. We've got a uh, we've got we've got the Mets versus the Dodgers game one division series on uh, on mute watching this. So if, are we uh, actually talking? Yeah, like we're talking. Recording? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know if uh, if Greta like suddenly like makes a loud noise. Um, it's not because she's you know developed some kind of disorder. It's just because she she tends to do that when she watches sports. Yes, um, it's uh, hard to control sometimes. So apologies in advance if it happens. Yes. So here we are, back to the Silmarillion. We go. We're back. We're back. There and back again. I guess you could say. Oh. There and back again. Nice one. Yeah, nice. I dig that. Give myself a high five. It's pretty that sweet, one. Johnny. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Yep. That was completely spontaneous. Amazing. Completely spontaneous. That's amazing. Yeah, How easily on, it comes. I should have been on that uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway show with my improv skills. <laughs> Whatever happened to that show anyway? Uh, I guess they just got bored with it or something. I guess. Yeah. They replaced it with Lip Sync Battle, which I think is like my new favorite show. Mm. I'm telling you. You're epic. missing out. Sounds epic. It's great. If, well, oh. if, if you love lip syncing as much as I do, you would like it. There's an art to lip syncing. Hey, um, if I like if I liked lip syncing, I would own all of Millie Vanilli's albums. Ha! <laughs> oh! How yeah. appropriate on such a rainy night. Girl, you know it's true. Yep. Mm-hmm. Don't they have one about rain, too? Blame it on the rain. Blame it on the rain. That's yeah. right. Which we could do, because it's my, uh, raining right now. That's my life's philosophy. Always. Mm-hmm. And forever. Blame so, the rain. So, of the Sindar. Of the Sindar. Mm-hmm. I bet you don't even know who the Sindar are. You know what? I did my reading. I know okay, who the Sindar yeah, you're are. Okay, but before, I, before you did the reading, you didn't know. No, I didn't. Yeah. But now you have a pretty good idea. I had a suspect, a suspicion, who they were. But right. I didn't know for sure. Right. But now I did. Was your, did your suspicion hold true? Mm-hmm. Well, good. Well, good for you. Yep. I'm going to give myself a high five. Nice. Nice. Uh, well, you gave yourself a, a woo, too. <laughs> that was totally a little, spontaneous. <laughs> a little Michael Jackson action going on. <laughs> channeling my Millie Vanilli. There you go. Yeah. What? Wait. Channeling your Millie Vanilli? That I don't even know what to make of that. All right. Anyway, we are already, I didn't like, actually say we're the already like 15 minutes in it. this episode. Uh, we, we're like totally off track already. I don't think we're 15 minutes in. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get that far in. Okay. Be completely off track. All right. So we just put our game faces on. Is that what you're uh, saying? Hey, you know, I mean, sometimes we do that. I mean, hey, you know, you're the listeners out there. If you like us getting way off track and our <laughs> witty banter, then <laughs> let us know and we'll keep going. Um, but yeah. There's plenty more where that came from. Oh, plenty. Guaranteed. It's nothing but witty banter and... In our house at all times. Yep. Um, and we should. I mean, we should just do a podcast that's just basically like recording our entire all of our conversations, like regular conversations, like during the day. That would be twenty four seven entertainment. That could be epic. That could be. That's like a. Re- that's like a, what was that show? It's like um, you know that thing that was on MTV that I was never that I never watched or like Big Brother. Ooh, we could pioneer. Ooh, real world. That's what run. I was thinking of. I was thinking of real world. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, basically, where they like taped you twenty four seven. So are you suggesting that we just like wear mics, hooked up to a recording device? Maybe. I'll have to flesh no, that I'm, one out. I'm not. Uh, not really. I don't know. Okay. All right. Anyway, let's do some haiku. Let's do it. Um, I wrote more than one. I always get time. caught off guard. I never have my haiku theme song ready. Uh, that is really disappointing. So um, maybe, maybe start. Uh, we can we can use a beach house song. That is like the opposite of what high key music should be. As much as I love Beach House. No! Stop! <laughs> this, is, stop. this is our new dreary Tolkien high th- high key theme. Psych. There it is. There it is. I knew you were just pulling that chain. Let's go. Prove it. Drop it like it's hot. Drop it. That was Dropping some pretty awesome bomb. air keyboarding that you were doing over there. Yeah. Key, uh, air Sing, synth- single, single key single air Single key synth- synthesizing. Single key air synth. That's how I get yes. my groove on to the Tolkien room. That was actually song, super or appropriate. Or theme. That was really appropriate considering that I mentioned lip syncing earlier. Yeah. So you were like doing the instrument version of lip syncing. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty awesome. That guy's pretty excited about his he home run. He's super excited about his home run. That guy looks like Andy Dwyer. Oh, yeah. I don't know his real name. Kind of does. What's Daniel is Murphy is his name. What? Oh, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. I'm thinking of Chris Pratt. <laughs> yes. The player is Daniel Murphy. Oh, yeah. okay. They kind of look alike. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I, I wish I could think of a good Andy Dwyerism right now that you brought him up. Well, if you did, you'd be wrong. <laughs> and right. And right. <laughs> yeah. They were right. <laughs> All right, haiku. You want to go first haiku. or me? Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll go first. Well, no, you know I have more than one. I haven't decided which one I want to read yet. So you we, we just do both. I mean, it's our podcast for crying out loud. We can I do thought, more than one if we want to. Okay, I thought we were only doing. Okay, how many did you write? Hey, look, this is episode forty, yo. All right. Dang. I'm just saying we deserve. We want to do a couple extra haiku ourselves. You know. I say let's celebrate. Yeah. And do more than one. Okay. Each. All right. Well, are you going first or me? Yeah, I'll go first. All right. Did you write more than one? I wrote two. Okay, good. So I'll do one, then you do one, then I'll do one, and you do one. It'll be a pattern. Sounds good. Okay. So here's my first one. This is for the Silmarillion of the Sindar chapter. Friends new and long lost join forces to fight orcs and to build great halls. Nice. Yeah. I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty good. Did you awesome. did you actually listen to it? I did. I was a little disappointed in your reaction, if I'm being quite honest. Well, you need to pay me more money I expected next time. More, I expected more praise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amazing. Fine. No, I thought it was pretty good. I did too. Thanks. Good job. I appreciate it. I pat myself on the you back. You deserve a pat on the back. Yeah, and Michael, <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> That's the right. thing. All right, your turn. All right. An ocean not crossed. A mighty people gather to the great elf king. An ocean not crossed. That's awesome. Oh, it's good. You're talking about those elves that missed the boat, am I right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like that. That's um... Right. All right, here's my second one. Luthien is born. Dwarves appear. Or may rides. Good triumphs. For now. For dun, now. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yes. Good job. Thanks. It's pretty I think that one pretty much sums up the chapter, so yeah. we're going to so say too much more after that, but... Anyways, I guess you can read your second one now. All right. Here we go. Melion, queen and mother of the twilight maid. Whoa, dream weaver. Ooh. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. I actually worked that one in there because uh, last time we talked about Melion in depth, um, 
one another and uh, someone oh, has right. he hasn't written it in a while, but um, one of our listeners uh, joked about how we should have worked in the Dreamweaver thing with uh, the have. Thingle and Millie and right. Millie on chapter from Wayne's World, yes. you know, from yes. when uh, when Wayne um, sees uh, Cassandra. Yeah, yes. it's like he does the Dream Dreamweaver music mm-hmm. with all the sparklies around it. Yeah, so anyway, I, like that. I worked it in right there. That was really good, Johnny. That was a pretty good falsetto too. Thank I'll you. I think that. Yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful uh, description to Twilight Maid. Yeah, the Twilight Maid. Twilight Maid. I'm gonna be a Twilight Maid. Hmm. I think that would be lovely. Well, if you had a high elf king as your father, and you know a uh, the eyes, goddess yeah. as your mother, quasi angelic <laughs> being as your mother, then may have, I may have had a chance. You could have. But oh well. But maybe next time. Unfortunately, that's only reserved for Kim Kardashian. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here all night, folks. Uh, hopefully, Kim's not one of our listeners. Or maybe, hopefully, maybe she is. <laughs> hopefully, she is. Yeah. That actually was a compliment, wasn't it? Well, it was. It was kind of poking fun at like, you know, pop culture references to celebrities. You know. Oh right. Yes. I'm I'm totally meta on my humor. It's like you know, there's like three layers going on to what I'm to my humor. We're all yeah. Get that meta thing from Tolkien, don't you? Yeah. All right, Josh. Josh sent he he sent in three. You know what? I'm gonna read all of Josh's. He sent in three. Not because not because Josh. uh, Not not because not because Josh is like you know. Uh, super fan number one. Super fan number one, but because I'm too lazy to actually post any of them on the actual post when I put it up, uh, I don't want to worry about doing it. And that. plus, it's our 40th episode. That's right. So we're going to keep celebrating. No, no, you're super fan number one, Josh, so, you know, here we go. All right. Nalgrim by Thingol. Yet Kazad they call themselves. Ale's stunted kids. <laughs> stunted kids. That's <laughs> the best. Ale's stunted kids. All right. Numero dos for Josh. Darkness in Midgard. But Beleriand shines bright by Queen Maiar's touch. Hmm. I like it. Right on. So really All right. good. Number three. Elway hath known peace. Greycloak and Doriath lived, now hidden for war. Hidden for war? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, hidden for war. Yeah, that's what he has. I would have thought maybe hidden from war, but anyway, I didn't write the thing. You didn't write the thing. He's right. probably thinking on a deeper level. Probably is much deeper. Right now. Well, good job, works. Josh. Thanks for sharing, well, you. Well done. Very right. well done. Not just medium rare, but well done. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll let that one slide. Maybe better. Mm-hmm. All right, Mary Grace. Well, Mary you Grace. you twisted Mary Grace Mary Grace's arm into writing a long form poem. I did I did us. make it very clear though that she was not to feel any pressure to get the long form poem in, but that it would I think be... you I think you promised her to, that she would be super fan number one if she did. Josh, I'm just saying I didn't tell her I, to do that, but she I'm pretty sure she promised that. I don't think I did, <laughs> but it was yesterday. So I was totally joking about know. that, but so maybe maybe you did. I don't know. I'll have to ask Mary Grace. I can't remember what I said. uh, It's kind of a crazy day. If you did, then maybe they'll have to arm wrestle for it. For super fan number one. How do you arm wrestle over Skype? Mm. That could be interesting. Yeah. Or maybe maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they'll have a haiku off. (gasps) Dude, we should do like an entire episode. (laughs) No. Oh, man. You're not going to totally went too far with that. I don't want to get... Yeah, you know. Well, you and I could do a haiku off, but I don't want like our... Our fans like you know doing a yeah I guess that's off. true yeah we don't want to set them against each other yeah exactly this is yeah. about bringing people together right it's about union yeah and love and peace peace and harmony yes and hugs and uh, yeah all right yeah Mary Grace's long form poem on this chapter wait I thought did she have a haiku too not that I saw oh okay well I'm glad she got the long form in I'm ready all right here we go. Elu Thingol and Melian so fair. At the close of the first age, great joy was theirs. Luthien Tenuviel was born, their child, who would be the only one. Before the end of her life, a great fate would be run. Mm. Over the blue mountains, the dwarves came to Beleriand. The Sendar called them Nalgrim, stunted people, or Khazad. 
They had built great halls made out of hardest stone, the greatest of them Moria, it was theirs alone. When the Nalgrim came, the elves found out and were amazed that they were not the only beings sent to Middle-earth to stay. King Thingol was pleased and welcomed them into his land, but Melian warned him that Arda's peace would not always stand. So Thingol requested the Nalgrim to build him a palace that was strong, and they did, and Thingol gave them pearls for their labor so long. When it was finished, Minigroth's Thingol's palace was named. It was so fair and beautiful that it acquired great fame. The peace of Arda slowly waned, as Melian had foretold, and the Nalgrim told Thingol, evil beasts of old are awakening, and soon to Beleriand they will come. So Thingol turned his thoughts to defending his home. Fell beasts were they that came out of the shadow, wolf things, orcs, and others, and their numbers did grow. And thanks to Thingol, the Sindar were ready with swords, and they drove off the beasts, so all was safe once more. Very nice. Oh, I like that. Well done. Well done, Mary Grace, Very as usual. well done. Yep. I've come to expect no less yes. than wonderfulness. And, that and was... apparently a long-form poem every episode is what Greta expects now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Only if it doesn't take away from your other schoolwork. That's right. What you're getting graded on takes priority. Yes. Just set the record straight. But that was beautiful and wonderful. And thank you. Thank you for whipping that up. For me, and now I think we're done here, Joe. That pretty much sums up the entire all chapter. Done. So, um, thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. yeah. See y'all next time. And thanks again, Mary Grace. You're the best. For reals. Psych. No, I mean, she really is the no, best. No, no, she is, but like we're not really stopping. Oh, we're not. No. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But you are like seriously the best. Yeah. And I, I really don't think... I think she started writing that, like, yesterday. I know. So that was... That was impressive. Mm-hmm. It was. Good job. Absolutely. Well done. And thank you, Josh, too. Mm-hmm. I love our super fans. Yep. They're pretty much the best. Super duper. They're super, super, super fans. Super duper extra. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Times a million. Times infinity. All right. Okay. We've exhausted that. Yeah. Now, moving on. Moving on. Beat that. Should we uh, talk about the chapter? Beat that one to death. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. Club. Okay. Let's talk about the chapter now that we're 30 minutes into the episode. Gosh, How long are we into the episode? I can't believe you. No, we're only oh, like 17 minutes. We're good. All it right. It feels like 30. So back to back to the Silmarillion. So where do, where did we leave off with the Silmarillion? Silmarillion, right? Do you remember what the last few things that had happened? Were? I actually don't. Nope. I have no clue. I relied heavily on my glossary of names and places. Do you don't remember? You, you don't remember what chapter nine was about? Um, of the flight of the Noldor. Mm-hmm. The Noldor. Why were the left. Why were the Noldor flying? Uh, Melkor was chasing them. Other way around. Oh, that's right. They were chasing Melkor because he had the the Silmaril. That's right. And that's who was he right. with? Who was Melkor with? Ungoliant. That's right. The giant spider. Exactly. Uh, it's all coming back to me now. There you go. Ah, nice. And then, uh, what had Melkor and Ungoliant done that was really bad? Oh, they killed the trees. That's right, they killed the two trees. They killed the two trees. Killed the two trees of Valinor. That was just wrong. Yeah. Look what you did, that, like, you little wrong. jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This hate's wrong. Nice going, level. guys. Nice going. Way to ruin it for everyone. We can ruin like priceless life giving beings forever. Mm. Alright. Yeah, so things did not end in a happy way. It's only the metaphysical center of our existence. Gosh. (laughs) Uh, Pretty bad. Yeah, so hey, so that's where that's where we're picking up and and really what this chapter is, is it's a it's it's almost like um let's now all that all that stuff has happened, and things have really fallen apart in Valinor, let's go check in on our friends that we left behind in Valinor, oh, like, several thousand years ago. Oh, right? okay, that's where I was confused. Yeah. The timing was weird to yeah. me. Yeah, it goes back, right? It is starting oh, to, so okay. It goes back to when, um, right after the all of the um, elves who had gone to Valinor had left. Okay. Galerion. Okay. Okay. 
and and it picks up with the elves that were left behind, and specifically with Thingol and Melion. Right. right. Okay. okay. But this all, but so chapter ten happens before chapter nine. For the most part, yeah. Like way before. The end of it starts to get starts to pick up with where okay. chapter nine yeah. left yeah. off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that might have been a little confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, also of note, starting here now, this map in the very back act all of a sudden becomes useful. Right? For the first nine chapters, uh, up until now, this map has really okay. been useless for us. Right? Uh, okay. Yep. Now this map is actually useful. Okay. And um, because the rest, pretty much the rest of the Silmarillion takes place in Beleriand. Um, so, for example, you see Doriath there in the middle of it, even though it's kind of split between the mm-hmm. two pages. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have Follis over there, which is the, the coastal region that they talk about. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. And then you have the Blue Mountains, the Arid Luin, um, over to the east, to the, on, the, on the far right. And if you go over there across those mountains, that's where, um, like, the, the Ari- Ariador, the, the place that, um, that, like, the hobbits come to live, when the hobbits come along several ages, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in, the, in the Third Age. Mm-hmm. That's where the hobbits eventually come along, oh, okay, in okay. Eriador. Okay. So this land, Beleriand, is like is like over the mountains and to the west from where the Shire eventually is. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. Yeah. So um, so this map is all of a sudden useful. Just making that point. Okay. You with me? I'm with you. All right. Cool. So there's been really. This chapter covers three ages of the chaining of Melkor. Now, how long is an age? A thousand years. Well, I don't know. Oh. I don't. I don't know that anyone really knows for sure. Oh, okay. well, I got my computer in front of me really here. Let's that see was if, a trick question. Let's see if the uh, if the people who are smarter about Tolkien than I am know for sure. Um, like how long? Surely is Tolkien has written this down somewhere. Um, I hope so. Let's see. Well. Ages of the Chaining of Melkor. Here we go. The Chaining of Melkor refers to his imprisonment for three ages after the war for sake of the elves. After their final victory in the Siege of Atumno, Tolkis captured Melkor and bound him with the great chain on Ange- Gynor. He was carried by he was carried to Valinor and sentenced to his long term of incarceration by the elder king and chief of the Valar, Manwe. During this period, which is uh, divided into in three ages of 100 Valian years each, the days of bliss occurred. So um, 100 Valian years is each age. Yeah, which I don't know that <laughs> that again does not really do the trick. We don't know how long a Valian. A Valian year is reference to the passage of time in Valinor before the two trees were destroyed by Melkor and Ungoliant. Valian years ended with the rising of the sun during the first age. There are approximately nine point. 582 solar years in a valley in a year, and 14,325 years solar years in the years of the trees. That's very confusing. That is quite confusing. Um, so basically, one valley in a year is about 10 years, 10 regular years, and, and then 14,325 solar years in the years of the trees. I think we just need to stop because it's making my head hurt. Okay. Anyway. It's a long time. This is a really long time. Really, really right? long time. More so than a basic, thousand This years. wasn't just like, you know, uh, they went over, you know, they went over to, Val- to uh, Valinor for a couple of, you know, for a couple of weeks, you know, right. took an extended vacation and then right. all this stuff happened with Melkor. Like, right. This is a long, long time. And so they've been right. separated for a really long time. Yes. Um, okay. And, and that's where we pick up at the beginning of this chapter. Um, going back just after the, the, um, who, the Noldor and the, Sen, uh, Noldor and the Teleri and the, who are the third, why can't I think of the third, um, the Vanyar, um, when they had all gone over to Valinor. And Thingol and Melian had stayed behind. And a whole bunch of other elves as well hadn't made the trip. Right. Now, and it says, um, uh, the, the elves of Valeriand, uh, from the mariners of Círdan to the wandering hunters of the Blue Mountains beyond the river Gelion, 
Um, they are called the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Starlet Beleriand. Mm -hmm. And although, so they're called the Grey Elves. And mm -hmm. although they were more Quindi, meaning elves not of the light, under the, leaders, under the lordship of Thingol and the teaching of Melian, they became the fairest and the most wise and skillful of all the elves of Middle-earth. Mm -hmm. So they became, because they had Thingol for their king, and remember Thingol had, had actually been to Valinor and had seen the light of the two trees right. and had been... You had spent some time there because he was mm -hmm. one of the, he was one of the um, few elves that went over the first time that were brought right. over to kind of see Valinor and then mm -hmm. convince their brethren to come right. back with him. Yep. So Thingol has actually been over there, even though he chose not to go this time. And then yes. Melian, of course, is Amaya, right? Yes. So, so she's to have them, to, what? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, so she's been to Valinor as well. Yeah, yeah. To have them for your king and queen is, um, is going. You're going to learn a lot from them. Yes. So. Um, so that's, that's the Sindar, um, and they settle in this region called Beleriand. So it's, it's, you know, it's almost like they're, they're kind of, they're almost to Valinor and they, they like, they kind of, you can tell they kind of care about Valinor, but they decided they really loved this area too. Yes. And so they're, you know, the gray elves, I think is significant of them being like, they're not quite the... Elves of the light, but they're not quite the elves of the darkness who just completely rejected Valinor right, either. Right. They're just kind of stuck in between. Yes. The two worlds. Um, notably, it talks about the birth of Luthien, uh, the daughter of Thingol and Melian, although she doesn't play a huge part in the story until much right. later, several chapters later. Right. Um, all right. Um, and, you know, Stop me to interject as you see fit, because okay. there's a lot of stuff to, to hit in this chapter, so I'm mm -hmm. going to try and hit the high points. Sure. Um, all right. The next thing we're told is that the dwarves come over the mountains, over the Blue mm -hmm. Mountains. Mm -hmm. So the dwarves, of course, had been created by Aule, yes. but they were not allowed to really... They were spared by Iluvatar and given, given souls by him, mm -hmm. um, but they were not allowed to... Um, uh, awaken until the the elder children of Iluvatar had awakened, right, and had come along. Which were the elves. Exactly. Yes. So now they come along, and how would you describe their relationship with the elves? Oh, uh, they seemed friendly. I mean, I think the, um, you know, I, I think obviously it speaks to the elves being, you know, amazed, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of maybe taken aback a little bit by their arrival because they thought they were the only, you know, only living things in Middle Earth. Right. Um, and um, they couldn't really understand, mm -hmm. right, the dwarf speech. Right. But it seemed like they got along pretty well. Yeah, I think they get along okay, you know, especially at first. Um, yeah. You know, there is the problem of misunderstanding. And, you know, I think it's I think it's an interesting note that um, uh, that the elves, it says, they could understand no word of the tongue of the Nalgrim, which their ears was cumbrous and unlovely, and few ever of the Eldar have achieved the mastery of it. But the dwarves were swift to learn, and indeed were more willing to learn the elven tongue than to reach than to teach their own to those of alien race. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, it seems a little bit elitist to me that you know the elves are a little bit elitist. They look at the mm -hmm. dwarves and they're like, "Why would we learn your ugly even speech?" You know, mm -hmm. um, we're the beautiful you know children of mm -hmm. el elder children of Iluvatar. You know, firstborn right. children of Iluvatar. Right. Um, you know, why would we bother learning learning your ugly speech? Yes. So I get this sense of a little bit of uh, haughtiness on the part of yes, the elves in general, toward, yeah. especially towards the dwarves. They're a bit snobby. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And it seems like they also view the the dwarves as, as useful, you know what I'm saying, rather than like mm. valuable in and of themselves. They're kind of useful like to the dwarves practical. or to the elves. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, so, yeah, th that's that's some of my that's some of my thoughts on how they view them. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. but, but for now, things are things seem fine. You know, things are okay. Yeah. Um, what's the big project they help with? Uh, they build, um, they build Thingol's fortress. Yeah. Yeah. Minigroth. Minigroth, A thousand yes. caves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they, they're really good at building things, at crafting things out of, uh, out of stone. They love working with iron and copper rather than silver or gold. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and they they help um, Thingol build Menegroth. And this is a, he, they do it willingly. They do. It says, um, oh, where is it? Says it says they gave it willingly for, okay, so yeah, so Thingol sought aid and counsel of the dwarves. They gave it willingly, for they were unwearied in those days and eager for new works. And though the dwarves ever demanded a price for all that they did, whether with delight or with toil, at this time they held themselves paid. For Melian taught them much that they were eager to learn, and Thingol rewarded them with many fair pearls. Yeah. So the dwarves, um, even if they even if they enjoyed the work they were asked to do, they still wanted to be paid. They yeah. They still wanted recompense right. for it. Oh, yeah. So, um, so it says they labored long and gladly for Thingol, and they held themselves paid because of the beautiful pearls they were able that Thingol was able to give them uh, mm-hmm. because of his good friend Kirdan, who was the oh, the, the lord of yes. the elves um, near in uh, what is it, Phallus, yeah. yeah, near the sea, near the sea, yeah. Um, so yeah, you know things things seem to be okay. Um, they the the dwarves do seem to really appreciate Melian. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they're definitely not, like, best buds. Right. Right? But but they seem to have a good working relationship, and I think they realize that they would both be stupid mm-hmm. to not get along. Yeah. Like, they realize that they could both offer, you know, they could offer each other, you know, like, that they could serve each other well. Mm-hmm. Um... Okay, so why? Let's see. Why don't we pause there um, and do a quick commercial break, and then we'll come back and continue with um, having built Minigroth now. Um, things start to go. You know, things things have been going really well so far for the Sindar, uh-huh. and then some bad stuff starts to happen. So we'll pause here, and we'll come back and pick up with the bad stuff. Sounds, Sounds good? good. Yeah. All right. Don't go away. Don't go away. Hey, 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 Tolkien Roadsters. What's shaking? Greta Carswell here, just getting my groove on to the Tolkien haiku theme music. Man, that's an awesome song. You know what else is awesome? Feedback on the Tolkien Road on iTunes. Oh yeah, you heard me right. iTunes feedback is one of the best ways you can tell the world about your undying love for this podcast. Because it lets those knuckleheads at Apple know that the Tolkien Road is where it's at. I mean, come on. Why didn't they know that already? Am I right? So next time you're waiting in line to pick up some delicious tacos, surfing the World Wide Web, brushing up on a Tom Bombadil factoid, or keeping it real in whatever way you keep it real, pop on over to iTunes and let the human race know what you think about the Tolkien Road. We're all dying to know for reals. Party on, y'all. And we are back. We're back. All right. So, dwarves, elves, living together in happiness and peace and harmony. Kind of. Uh, smiling on their brother. Everybody getting mm. together, trying to love one another right now. Wow. And, uh... Nicely done. Nice, nice, yeah. That was pretty sweet. Yes. Pat yourself on the back. You deserve it. Yeah. So, um, things are going well, but it says, so they go through two ages of the captivity of Melkor, which might be around 2,000 years, maybe even longer. Uh Um, and the dwarves became, start becoming troubled. It says, as the third age of the captivity of Melkor drew on, the dwarves became troubled, and they spoke to King Thingol, saying that the Valar had not rooted out utterly the evils of the north. And now the remnant, having long multiplied in the dark, were coming forth once more and roaming far and wide. They are fell beasts, they, there are fell beasts, they said, in the land east of the mountains, and your ancient kindred that dwell there are flying from the plains to the hills. Um, and ere long the evil creatures came even to Beleriand, over passes in the mountains, or up from the south through the dark forests. Wolves there were, or creatures that walked in wolf shapes, and other fell beings of shadow. And among them were the orcs, who afterwards wrought ruin in Beleriand. 
but they were yet few and wary, and did not but smell out the ways of the land, awaiting the return of their Lord. Whence they came, or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild, in which they guessed all too near, it is said. So the Avari are the unwilling. So if you go back to your chart in the middle, one of the charts here, mm-hmm. um, Open, open to the chart, Greta, class. Okay. Open to the chart, class. I thought it was optional. No. Uh, okay. Not in my class. Yikes. All right, the chart is before the glossary or this after? This one, before the glossary. Okay. Got it. All right, make sure it's the right chart. Nope, it's not the right chart. No, it's not the beer chart. <sighs> Look at the beer chart. All right, All right. here we go. The Quindy. Right there. Okay, the Avari. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See that? Mm-hmm. They are the unwilling, the unwilling. The elves who refuse the great journey. So when uh, when the Valar summoned the mm-hmm. elves, mm-hmm. there were many of them who just said, no, nah, I don't think so. Remember, mm-hmm. there were some, there were lots that said, yes, we'll go. And then they kind of fell out as they went. Right. And then the Avari were the ones who were just like, no, no, thank you. We like it here just fine, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and didn't even bother leaving. Where they originated well, They weren't from. nasty about it, were they? No, it was just more like, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. But anyway, the... They the, politely but, refused. But the Sindar, even the Sindar have been separated them for some, from them for some time. And so they're thinking that maybe the orcs are, um, are Avari who had become evil and savage in the wild. And it says, in which they guessed all too near. And do you remember going back mm-hmm. to much earlier in the Silmarillion where it said the orcs came from? Oh... Yes. I mean, I remember talking about it, but I don't remember the specifics. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have it marked in here, but basically, they were, um, uh, they were orcs who were corrupted by, or elves who were corrupted by Melkor. Yeah, go back to page 50. Um, it says, And thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the orcs and envy and mockery of the elves, of whom there were afterwards the bitterest foes. Mm-hmm. For the orcs had life and multiplied after the children of the after the manner of the children of Iluatar, mm-hmm. and not that had life of its own, nor the semblance of life could ever Melkor make since his rebellion in the Idolandale before the beginning. Okay. So say the wise. Okay. Um, yeah, and I know it, it mentions it elsewhere, and, and and Tolkien even talks about it some in one of his letters um, about the fact that the orcs, many of the, the original orcs, were. Um, Corrupted elves. Okay, in yes. In whatever way, you know, that, that corruption doesn't go into a lot of detail, but they were corrupted. Okay. Right. So they're saying, so we don't know for sure that they were, that the orcs were corrupted Avari, but there's a decent chance that they were. Yeah, Tolkien so. seems to say that there's a lot to that. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so just interesting thing to keep in mind about mm-hmm. orcs. Yep. Um, weapons. So... Up until this time, like, you know, you might remember going back to Valinor, too. For a long time, there were no weapons in Valinor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they and then, them. Right. And then Feanor starts making for himself weapons. Yes. Right? Because uh, he starts getting suspicious of others, and mm-hmm. so he starts making weapons for himself. Mm-hmm. For himself. Well, maybe even simultaneous with that, something similar is happening over here with the Sindar. Therefore, Thingol took thought for arms, which became his, pe- which before his people had not needed, and these at first the Nalgrim smithied for him, for they were greatly skilled in such work, though none among them surpassed the craftsmen of Nagrod, of whom Telkar the smith was greatest in renown. Um, the now, so the Nalgrim, the dwarves, you know, build a lot, create a lot of the weapons at first. Um, their smithcraft, smithcraft, indeed, the Sindar soon learned of them. Yet in the tempering of steel alone, of all crafts, the dwarves were never outmatched even by the Noldor. And in the making of mail of linked rings, which was first contrived by the smiths of Belagos, their work had no rival. Mm. Um, you might remember, too, we, I didn't mention this, but do you remember who were the, who were the dwarves closest with in terms of the elves? Oh, the Noldor. The Noldor. Yeah. Do you remember why that is? Because they, they're craftsmen, right? right? I mean, the, the Noldor build and mm-hmm. create. Yes, and and also, more to the point, um, Aule created the dwarves, mm-hmm. 
and he was closest to the Noldor. Noldor. Right. The Noldor the Noldor were most like Aule. Okay. Right? Yep. So they've they've caught kind of a kindred um you know, their their godfather as is if you will, is like the same the same person, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um so they, they just they get each other in that way, I guess you could say. Um, all right, the Nondor. So um, the Nondor, again, we're talking about kind of all this, the genealogy of elves. And the Nondor were elves that were to Larry that started out on the journey, mm-hmm. but they stopped at the Misty Mountains, which, you know, is like half, is like that was like the halfway point. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they kind of chickened out at the Misty Mountains and said, uh-uh, no more, we're not going any further. Right. Um, however, a group of those elves, led by Denethor, um, decided, they, it says, hearing rumor of the might of Thingol and his majesty and of the peace of his realm, remember, because Thingol had once been their king, as the, as the Teleri. Oh, right, right. yes, um, okay. Hearing, hearing rumor of the might of Thingol and his majesty and of the peace of his realm, gathered such host of his scattered people as he could and led them over the mountains into Beleriand. There they were welcomed by Thingol as kin long lost that returned, and they dwelt in Osirion, the land of seven of seven rivers. All right. So, so you, why? Yeah, go ahead. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to figure out why were they scared? Is that why they wanted protection? Is that why they? Is that why they came to Thingol's um, place, or like what motivated them? I think they just heard it was really cool. Oh, um, okay. So it didn't yeah. really have anything to do with the orcs or the. Impending well, it doesn't doom. say so here. I mean, maybe, maybe there's some, maybe it's somewhat related. Maybe they heard that Thingol was mighty, mm. and and it was starting to get kind of rough for them over there. Okay. Um, if you go back to page fifty four, um, it says there then one arose in the host of Olway, which was ever the hindmost on the road. Linway, he was called. He forsook the westward march and led away a numerous people southwards down the great river, and they passed out of the foreknowledge of the knowledge of their kin until long years were past. Mm-hmm. Those were the Nondor, and they became a people apart, unlike their kin, save that they loved water and dwelt most beside fall beside falls and running streams. Mm-hmm. Greater knowledge they had of living things, tree and herb, bird and beast, than all other elves. And after years, Denethor, son of Linway, turned to turn again west at last and led a part of that people over the mountains into Beleriand ere the rising of the moon. Okay, that's what we just read about. Yeah. So okay. we don't know too much about exactly why they stopped in the first place and why they decided to move on. Okay. Um, but it could be related to the to the monsters coming mm-hmm. along. Mm-hmm. All right. And they were welcomed by Thingol. Yeah. I thought that was interesting, because part of me thought that he might be like, lost your chance. Yeah. You know? Like, no, I already got the dwarfs here, right? And... You know, should have, would have, could have. Well, but he was obviously gracious with them. But Thingol's got to got to recognize that he he didn't go all the way through with the journey either. So that's got to be a little oh, humbling for him true. with respect that's to true. other elves. He did go further though. He did, but, but he didn't go all the way. All the way. You know? I see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So he's probably a little bit more sympathetic mm-hmm. to their cause. Right. So now we have. Hanging out in Beleriand, we have not just Thingol's people, right? But we have the the non dwar and we have the dwarves. Right. Okay. So these have three groups. Mm-hmm. Well, and then there's Kyrdon's people at uh, Oh right. At Pal- uh, Fal- right. What is it? Mm-hmm. Falos. Falos. Yep. I yeah. see. Right. Yeah. Um, and by the way, if you look at that map, so Atumno, is that, no, Angband. Yeah. Ang, oh, Malkor's place? Angband is, mm-hmm. it's actually, you, you can't see it on the map, but it's like, it's basically like way up here. It's like way in the north. Right. Up here. Yes. You know, just basically just direct north of Doriath, keep mm-hmm. going past the mountains and everything. Okay. Um, just FYI. Got it. Um, it also speaks a little bit of the um, the 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 kirth, which are basically oh, yeah. it's an er, you know it's an early form of writing, 
By the Nalgrim, the Kirith were taken east over the mountains and passed into the knowledge of many peoples. But they were little used by the Sindar for the keeping of records until the days of war. Um, and much that was held in memory perished in the ruins of Doriath. Um, Dor- so we'll come to find out what happens to Doriath and why the ruin, why they, you know, the Doriath comes to ruins. But um, but there's a lot of good stuff here that you know that happens here that never gets passed on because you know the elves the Sindar didn't really embrace writing that much. Um, mm-hmm. uh, now, Darren the minstrel, Daron the minstrel, chief lore master of the kingdom of Thingol, devised his runes. Um, so. There were there was somebody there who you know within Thingol's kingdom who devised the runes right and passed them on to the uh, to the dwarves and that's how the writing spread mm-hmm. but unfortunately it wasn't very much embraced by Thingol so wait so these runes that he devised were they written yeah oh they were right. okay I was thinking that he basically just passed them on by word of mouth but I see yeah okay. So you say some some legends or some some history has been preserved, but not as much as could have been. Right. I see. Yes, indeed. Because of their, I think that was another reaction. Like that was another elitist move on the elf's part. We don't need to write. Our language is so beautiful. We'll just talk all the time. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure why they didn't embrace it at that time. Okay. Um. You know, I I think this note is helpful, but of bliss and glad life, there is little to be said before it ends. Mm -hmm. As works fair and wonderful, while still they endure for eyes to see, are their own record. Mm -hmm. And only when they are in peril or broken forever do they pass into song. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might have been an attitude of like, well, what do we have to write about? You know, things are really nice. Let's enjoy it, you know. Yeah. Um, Yeah. There could have been somewhat of an attitude like that. Let's live in the moment. Let's not worry about preserving it. That's right. Okay. Um, it also notes that Orome is still, still rides through Beleriand, mm-hmm. um, the great Valar, Orome, the rider. Yep. Blowing uh, his horn. Blo- blowing his horn and scaring people with his mighty horse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So now we get to picking up with Melkor and Ungoliant. Actually, Morgoth and Ungoliant. Now is what we'll be calling That's him right. Morgoth from mm-hmm. here on out. Yes. Um. So if you'll recall, they had they had fled north in Valinor, you know, in the Blessed Realm, and then had come over where the land gets really narrow, mm-hmm. and um, and then Ungoliant had realized that Morgoth had no intention of giving her the uh, uh, the Silmaril. Right. Oh, that was that was a strike. That was a foul ball. Okay. Oh, do you think it was a home run? I thought it was, man. No, yeah. can you not see the foul pole? Well, it's hard to tell from a distance, you know, whether which, which side it's on. Mm-hmm. It was definitely it's a little bad. straighter. That would have been gone. Tab yeah. would have been tab ball game. Yeah. All right. Dodged the bullet there. So, um, yeah. So Ungoliant and Morgoth get into a fight because Morgoth's being stingy with the Silmarils, which Ungoliant feels like should belong to her. Mm-hmm. They get into a fight. Uh, Ungoliant beats up Morgoth until um, until Morgoth's uh, friends, the Balrogs, come and start right. whipping Ungoliant and drive her away. Right. Yep. Um, and it says she. So remember, they're coming over. You know, if you look at the map, they're like they're coming over like way up here, mm-hmm. and then and then they kind of like come down here. And then eventually Ungoliant gets driven down this way. So she's coming straight towards Doriath. Right? Uh, I see. Yes. So she she stops in these mountains, and these mountains become um, the mountains of terror, or like the, the yeah, yeah, the mountains of terror, the arid border. She's like hiding underneath them, right? She's hiding within them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it says, Soon afterwards Ungoliant fled from the north and came into the realm of King Fingal, and a terror of darkness was about her. But by the power of Melion she was stayed and entered not into Neldoreth but abode long time under the shadow of the precipices in which Dorthonian fell southward. And they became known as Arid Gorgoroth, the mountains of terror, and none dared go thither or pass nigh them. Their life and light were strangled, and there all waters were poisoned. Um, not a good place to be. No, not at all. Uh, but Mel- Morgoth returns to Angband, to Angband, and built it anew, and he raises up Thangorodrim, which were basically like three really tall mountains. Um, 
the any the reeking towers of Thangor and they were so kind I, of like the the fortress about about Angband, the walls of Angband. So that's what those towers were. It says that he yeah he rebuilt Angband and then. I don't understand this. And above its doors, he reared the reeking towers. Mm-hmm. So he moved the mountain and, like, made the mountain? He kind of made his own. He made his own mountain. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay. Got Three it. mountains. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Near the gates of Morgoth. That's right. And then it says that the gates of Morgoth were about 150 leagues distant from the bridge of Menegroth. Mm-hmm. This is far and yet all too near. So what, like, about how far is that? 150 leagues. Um, how far is a league? And I, all I remember is 20,000 leagues under the sea, and that was really deep. Yeah, hold on. Let's see. I feel like a league is like 20 miles. I don't know. Oh, is it that far? I don't. I don't think so. Hold on. No. I can't be right. League. But it says that it's. I mean, it makes it sound like it, I mean, this far... It's three miles. One On league. land, the league was most commonly defined as three miles, though the length of a mile could vary from place to place, and depending on the er- the era. At sea, a league was three nautical miles, so so mm-hmm. basically 450 miles. I see, okay. Distant from the bridge of Menegroth. Mm-hmm. Far, and yet all too near. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And the orcs kept growing in number. Right, so the orcs multiply, and with Morgoth back, uh, he starts getting in charge, and he's like, all right, well, I'm back, so let's start attacking some more elves. Mm -hmm. And he basically sends orcs down into Beleriand, and they travel down onto either side. They kind of hem Doriath about, so if you go over to the map again and look for Doriath, right, they're they're basically like coming, there's orcs coming down this way, Mm-hmm. Here's Doriath, there's orcs coming down this way, and then there's orcs coming down this way. Yeah, uh, like on either side right? of it, yeah. And basically there's big concentrations of elves well fortified in Phalas and in Doriath, mm-hmm. but there's also lots of, like, kind of country elves spread all over Beleriand. Right. And they're easy easy prey for the for the mm-hmm. orcs, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But uh, eventually they, they defeat the orcs on the east side of Doriath. Okay. All right, so it says... Um, and Thingol, yeah, um, where is it? But the orcs came down upon either side of Minigroth, and from camps in the east between Kelon and Gelion, and west in the plains between Sirion and Narog, they plundered far and wide, and Thingol was cut off from Círdan at Eglorest. Therefore he called upon Denethor, and the elves came in force from region, Beyond, from region beyond Aros and from Assyriand, and fought the first battle in the wars of Beleriand. And the eastern host of the orcs was taken away between the armies of the Eldar, north of the Andram, and midway between Aros and Galeon. And there they were utterly defeated. And those that fled north from the great slaughter were way, waylaid by the axes of the Nalgrim that issued from Mount Dolmed. Few indeed returned to Angband. But the victory of the elves was dear bought, because... Oh, lots of people died. Just including who? Oh, including, um, what's his face? Um, Denethor. Denethor, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's the first battle between the forces of Morgoth, the first great battle between the forces of Morgoth mm-hmm. and the Sendar and the elves. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the help of the Nandor, um, they they triumph over them, and then eventually the dwarves as well. So it's it's kind of cool because it's this, you know, the forces of the good guys of Beleriand mm-hmm. unite together mm-hmm. to overcome the forces of Morgoth. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's a it's a dear bought victory because Denethor dies, and the people mm-hmm. of and the people of the Nandor kind of don't have a leader anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So some of them get absorbed into um, the Sindar, and some of them travel back into the east. Um, back over, back so back, over the, back to where they came from. Back to where they came from, oh, right? Okay. The green elves, yeah, they become the green elves. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if they're the green, the same green elves that are eventually in Mirkwood, you know. Mm-hmm. So like from the Hobbit, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the people, um, Legolas's people. I'm not sure if they're actually the same ones or not. Okay. Okay. Um, but it could be an, it's, it's an interesting question. I'll have to look that up. 
Um, yeah, but the bad part of it is is that the orcs on the west who are dividing uh, Phalas from Doriath, um, you know, they kind of succeed in cutting everybody off. And what the end result of all this is that Thingol um, learns that the orc host in the west was victorious and had driven Círdan to the rim of the sea. Therefore, he withdrew all his people that his summons could reach within the, fat, the fastness of Neldoreth and region. And Melion put forth her power and, forced, and fenced all that dominion round about with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilder, bewilderment. The girdle of Melion, that none thereafter could pass against her will or the will of the king Thingol, unless one should come with a power greater than that of Melion the Maya. And this inner land, which was long named Egl- Eglador, was after called Doriath the guarded kingdom, land of the girdle. Within it there was yet a peaceful, a watchful peace, but without there was peril and great fear, and the servants of Morgoth roamed at will, save in the walled havens of the Phallus. Um, so, in the west, while they have victory over the orcs on the eastern side, in the west, the orcs are kind of victorious. On the western side of Doriath, the, west, the orcs are victorious, and that results in Doriath becoming kind of this fenced-in isolated kingdom itself, right? Okay. And then Círdan and, and his people are, are kind of fenced really, they have, they, they're they really kind of stuck with their backs to the sea. So, so you were saying that the, the orcs basically were able to cut Círdan. Círdan. Círdan yeah. and those people off from Thingol. Uh-huh. And then... Where is, where does Thingol live? In Doriath. He does live in Doriath. Yeah. Okay. So, so Doriath is like that isolated little kingdom because of Melion, because of what Melion did, not because of what the orcs did, right? Well, Mel- Melion does that in in order to protect them from the, from the orcs, right? From the orcs, right? okay. So they basically just kind of left the people over in Phallus kind of hung out to dry? I guess you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, and and they really go into this isolationist mode from here mm-hmm. in Doriath, mm-hmm. the Sendar do. Yeah. So. Um, and and this is all again, we're kind of getting to the point as it says in this last last little bit here. Um, we are to the point where um, new tidings were at hand, which none in Middle Earth had foreseen. Neither Morgoth in his pits nor Melion in Minigroth. For no news came out of Amon, whether by messenger or by spirit, or by vision and dream, after the death of the trees. In this same time, Fanor came over the sea in the white ships of the Teleri, and landed in the Firth of Dringist, and there burned the ships at Lasgar. So we've already read about that, right? Right, so now we're all caught up with where we okay. left off in chapter 9. Okay, yeah. so this, ba- this part of most of this chapter is basically like a flashback. Right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But now we're caught up. Mm-hmm. With all the burning of the ships and stuff. Okay. Cool. That's where we are. That was a nice little history lesson. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the next couple of chapters are, are, are very similar to this. Um, the pace of the Silmarillion doesn't really pick up again until... Um, you know, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I'd rather just be left in ignorance... Well, there's good stuff in every chapter and things worthy of discussion, but the in terms of kind of moving ahead quickly as a plot, it doesn't pick up again for a couple of chapters. Okay. So, just FYI. So just more setting the stage? Yeah. Is that what's going Lots on? Lots of stage setting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got to set that stage. Got to. Got to create the secondary world, the secondary reality, right? Absolutely. Wouldn't be yes. talking without that secondary yes, reality. Yes, indeed. So, uh, any takeaways for you, Greta? Any any uh, life lessons learned here from chapter of the Cinder? Life lessons learned. Uh, when the going gets tough, just, you know, put a magic girdle around yourself and ignore all your other people around mm. you and life will be good. Good. Yeah. Very nice. I think that was actually from the book of Proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If only. When the going gets tough, put a magic girdle around yourself. <laughs> You know, it's good enough for Thingol and Melion. I mean, right on. Yeah. Uh, why not? Seriously. You know what I'm saying? 
But yeah. Protect yourself from orcs at all costs. At all costs. At all costs. If necessary, use a magic <laughs> <Yes, I'm there. laughs> Only as a last resort. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. What about you? Any life lessons? Yeah. Hmm? I had one. What's that? <laughs> I'm going to make you straight face. Okay. Nothing lasts forever. Even cold November rain. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you say... <laughs> Even gold? Even cold November rain. Oh. Nothing lasts forever. I thought you said only gold November rain. Nothing I was like, John, that's not forever. the lyric. Even cold November rain. Yeah, I love that song. But you know what? Um, I do too because it's true. It is true. Even, Even cold, cold November, November rain, rain doesn't, doesn't last, last forever. forever. Jinx. But in the moment, though, it seems like it might. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, how does that relate to what we just talked about? Well, because they live through, like, you know, this, these long ages of, like, happiness and... Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. And then yeah. all of a sudden, orcs, who are, like, the drying of the cold November rain. No, but... Uh, or are they the cold November rain? I was going to say, I feel like they should be the cold November rain, because they're... They're not... Because they're, they're mean... And they're bad, just like cold November rain is mm. mean and bad. How about strong adjectives? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> they're mean and bad and not nice. <laughs> and they hurt people. Innocent people. No. Hey, we're talking here. So, hey, well, you're right, nothing here. does last forever. That's right. Um, even, even magic girdles. Even... Oh, is that foreshadowing? Is that magic girl going to get penetrated in the following chapter? No, not, oh. I don't, I'm not saying in the following chapter. I'm not saying anything. Okay. Please no say. spoilers here. Um, no, I, enjo I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. Good. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Right on. I think we should end this. <laughs> and then put it to death. Just, let's just know, put this one out of its misery. We, I, I was going to say let's quit while we're ahead, but I don't think we're really ahead anymore. So I think we should just stop before we get more tangential. Cut it out. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you guys for listening. And yes. Up with us. You all yes. are the best. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Um, no, I enjoyed this chapter too. So. Yeah. It's uh, good. It's good stuff. It's good to be back in the Um yeah. Even if the next couple of chapters are... A little more informational than, you know, story. But mm -hmm. so, any idea how long we're going to be in the Silmarillion? Do you have? An well, idea? my plan is to finish it out oh, to before we go it? back to Lord of the Rings. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. I mean, there's there's 24 chapters of the Silmarillion proper, um, and then there's okay. a Calabath after that, which really would take us more than one episode. I'm not sure how oh, many. Oh, really? Okay. And then there's of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, which. We probably won't do that before we finish Lord of the Rings because that's kind of the Lord of the Rings story. We may do half of that. So you're saying that we're going to finish the Silmarillion proper before we go back to Lord of the Rings? Okay. Yeah. The 24 chapters. Yeah. So okay. so which means like 13 or 14 more chapters. Got it. Okay. I'm always bad at doing the math when it's like... I know. It's confusing. You know how many chapters do we actually... I think it's actually 14. Yeah, because you have to count. Yeah, because 11, 12, 13, and 14 is four. Right. And then, yeah. Yeah. It's 14 chapters it's 14 still. chapters. Okay. And a couple of those are really long, so we might end up having to do those as multiple episodes okay. as well. But so it's going we'll to be a see. while before we get back to fellowship. Yeah, you know, we can do whatever the heck we want. It's our podcast. So, I mean, if we get halfway down the road and we're like, let's go back and do book one or book two of Lord of the Rings. Okay. We might do we that. We can do that. Okay. Because it's our podcast. It's our podcast. Yeah. Darn straight. You know it. All right. All right, peeps. Oh, good. Keep Thank it real. Thanks for listening. Keep it real out there. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. You rock. And we'll uh, talk at you next time. We'll do. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. 
On the next episode, we begin our discussion of Tolkien's letters by taking a look at letter 250, wherein Tolkien speaks in depth of his faith. On October 26th, we'll continue our discussion of the Silmarillion with chapter 11 of The Sun and Moon and the Hiding of Valinor. Please tune in, and until next time, the road goes ever on.